Hello and welcome to Bristol Ideas. I'm Andrew Kelly. I've been reading Joseph Roth for over two decades and should say here what a debt we owe to translators like Michael Hoffman and publishers like Granter, who have worked hard to bring Roth's work back to public attention. For much of this time, I've wanted to read a full biography of Roth. And with Kieran Pim Pim's Endless Flight, The Life of Joseph Roth, we have this. Kieran Pim's book, said The Guardian, is the first English language biography of Roth. And what a superb book it is. Impeccably researched, extremely readable, and it must be said, grimly relevant in the wake of Putin's assault on Ukraine. Endless Flight is a grand tribute to one of the most discomforting literary geniuses of the 20th century. I'm joined by Kieran Pym today. Kieran, this is a terrific book about a great writer. Thank you for this. Well, thank you so much and thank you for having me on. Now, there's an enormous amount of research gone into this full life biography. He was a prodigious writer and published many books and articles in what was a short life. How did you approach the subject? Well, the first thing I did might be easiest to say how I came across his work. So 2002, three, um, his essay, The Wandering Jews, was published in English translation. Um, and it was recommended to me and I read it and it really got under my skin, this fascinating, strange piece of nonfiction that has a haunting quality, that rather beguiling quality where you feel like you don't quite know the author. He puts himself into the story to a certain extent, but you feel he's holding something back and you end up as fascinated by the author as by the Jewish communities of Europe that he's describing. So I read this book um, and I was fascinated and it got under my skin. I didn't read more of him for quite a long time and I, I kept meaning to get round to it. And then I was looking for a book to write after my last book. I was kind of searching around for a subject as one does. Um, and I happened to Google Joseph Roth um, and I read a review of his collected letters that, that mentioned that there is no biography of him in English and that these letters, which chart the whole trajectory of his adult life, um, are the closest thing that we have to a biography in English. And I thought, well, that's interesting. This is a, a major writer who doesn't have an English biography. I wonder if I could maybe start reading around and see if I could do something about that. So I really started reading in earnest. The first thing to do was to, to read Roth intensively, his fiction, his non-fiction, and then to start reading around him, reading around his life as well. And, you know, I'd sort of been, without realising it, I'd been doing that for quite a long time anyway, because his world was my great-grandparents' world on, on my mother's side, um, where he grew up, a little town of Brody, um, which is now in western Ukraine, was there, was at that time in kind of far eastern Austria-Hungary by the border of the Russian Empire. That town was really not so far from a little town um, where my great-grandfather grew up, a little shtetl called Mostiska, um, which is now on the Polish-Ukrainian border, just into Ukraine. Um, so I've been fascinated for some time by my grandparents and great-grandparents European Jewish world. Um, I had been reading quite a lot around that for some time and it turned out that I you know I had a reasonable body of knowledge anyway that turned out to be useful for understanding Roth's world as well. Um, but I went on to, to read more, um, reading his work, reading around his world and I got to a point where I thought I think maybe I could do this. Um, let's see and um, I I took it from there, really, and I was lucky enough to get a publishing deal with Granter. Um, and then then the, then it just kind of developed from there, really. Uh, and then I suppose the next thing was the research, um, really researching in earnest once I got the deal. Um, and first thing I did was I thought, you know, I, I had this idea that I would research his life by following in his footsteps mm. around Europe. Um, and the first thing seemed to be to 
go to Ukraine, go to Brody, where he grew up. I stayed in uh, what's now Lviv, was then Lemberg when it was part of Austria-Hungary. Uh, this was May 2019. And of course, at that time, we were blissfully unaware that there would be any impediments to research kind of looming on the horizon. So I had this trip. I spent a week in, in Ukraine. It was wonderful. I based myself in Lviv. Absolutely fell in love with Lviv. Not a city I would have thought to go to otherwise, but an enchanting historical city, you know, absolutely steeped in history. Um, and I went to Brody for a day. I, I wandered the streets where that he would have known. Um, I, with the help of uh, an English-speaking tour guide, uh, I got into the, the gymnasium, the secondary school that he, he went to and had a look around and spoke to some students there now. Um, and I just, I kind of, I soaked up the atmosphere, really. Um, I, obviously, I spent time in Lviv where I was staying, which was the first place that, that Roth went to when he succeeded in escaping Brody, which was, you know, really something he was very keen to do from from his teenage years. Um, it was this kind of little town. It's a kind of provincial backwater. It was synonymous with the provincial illiteracy and um, kind of lack of culture. It was a very, very Jewish town. And um, it was somewhere that was known as a kind of hub of the Jewish enlightenment in the in the 19th century. Um, but to the kind of urbane, sophisticated Jewish populations of, of Vienna and of Berlin, it was somewhere that was really redolent of, of everything that they had tried to escape, somewhere that their parents or grandparents had left behind. Um, and Roth was very much of, of that persuasion, you know, from his mid-teens onwards, I think, he was keen to escape and he was keen to to move to Vienna uh, and to be a kind of cosmopolitan, uh, you know, you know, sophisticated character. Um, and so he wanted to go to Vienna for university. He settled on a compromise, which was that instead he would go to Lemberg, where his uncle and family lived, um, and he would stay with his uncle who would pay for his university education. So Roth spent quite a lot of time in Lemberg, um, staying with his with his relatives. Um, he didn't last long at university there, though. He then moved on to, to Vienna, which was where he really wanted to be. Um, but so I spent time researching in Lviv, researching in Brody, uh, and then I had this idea that I would kind of follow him all over the place and then COVID came along and <laughs> it didn't quite work out uh, as I had planned but I was thankfully um, I did manage at the after the pandemic kind of, well when things started to ease up um, while there were still travel restrictions in place but there was a certain amount of movement about a year ago so late 2021 um, I managed to get to Paris for a few days. January of this year, very late on, um, I managed to go to Amsterdam and Ostend, which were key locations as well. Um, I, I had a little stopover on my way back from, from Ukraine in 2019. Um, my flights had a stopover at, um, at Vienna. Um, just for a few hours. And I didn't think that would be the only chance that I got to go there while I was researching the book. But um, I had a few hours and just out of interest, really, I, I wandered around Leopoldstadt, which was the, the Jewish quarter, which was where my my grandparents on my mum's side were born. And it's where, when Roth moved there to go to the University of Vienna, um, it's where he lived as well. Um, so I had a little wander around then, not thinking that would be the only chance I got, but I did actually manage to see a few addresses then and just soak up a little bit of atmosphere. So I sort of did Vienna, but not in as much detail as I would have liked. Can you, Didn't can manage you tell... to get to Berlin, but yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, sorry, we'll, we'll come back to Berlin. I'll come back. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about his family, particularly his, his mother and father, because that yeah. they do feature in his work? Sure. Well, so his father um, was, yeah, he, his father 
basically went insane before Roth was born. Um, it's all a little bit murky and uncertain, but it seems that they never met. Um, Roth certainly said that he never met his father. Um, his father went insane, had no involvement in in raising Roth. Um, the story goes that um, he was on a train traveling um, traveling back across Europe. Uh, he was a grain buyer um, and it seems that possibly he was ripped off. He had um, he lost a load of grain that he had bought that he'd been keeping in a, in a storehouse. Um, and this seems to have kind of pushed him over the edge and he seems to have gone insane. And then this happened on, on a train. He was, um, he was kind of manhandled off the train and taken into psychiatric care and then goes into the care of, of a rabbi, um, and remains kind of living with the rabbi, um, in some state of insanity, um, never met his son as far as we know. So Joseph Roth grew up fatherless mm. with his mother, the only child of his mother, um, living with her father, his grandfather. Um, so the three of them living together um, in, in this town of Brody in, in what's now Ukraine. Um, and the mother was perhaps understandably extremely protective of her precious son having lost her husband to insanity um she certainly didn't want to lose her son and so she was incredibly kind of protective to the point that drove joseph roth rather mad really and he couldn't wait to escape to kind of shake off her mm. over solicitous attentions um and so once he he left Brody and went off to university um he had minimal contact with her, really, uh, which she found incredibly upsetting. He was staying in Vienna, um, when, well, in Lemberg first, and then in Vienna, um, but really making very little efforts to correspond with her. There's a rather poignant letter that I quote in the book where she says that she's heard from her brother, his uncle, who he was staying with, um, that's, that he's doing very well, but... Um, she never hears from him directly and when, when is this you know she hears that he's going to write to her but this letter never arrives and i'm waiting for your letter it's very poignant you know the mother who who loved him dearly and hated to let him out of her sight was obviously very upset that he had at the earliest opportunity um kind of shaken her off and gone to forge his his independent way in life really um so a very difficult upbringing, mm. an absence of a father, a mother who was anything but absent, who was so omnipresent that um, he kind of almost disowned her. And so he emerges into adult life with a, a kind of real imbalance of parenting, if you like. Um, and just on the cusp of adult life, um, halfway through his university studies, the First World War comes along, which abruptly brings an end to to his childhood and, and and everything changes and everything the world that he had grown up in collapses and everything starts going downhill from there this was such a pivotal moment in his life and his work and i'll come back to that when we discuss the the books and so on. just a couple of other contextual points can we talk about his his jewishness and his his ambivalence about being jewish of course um yeah this is one of the fundamental elements of his his character really and something that determines the course of his life um i mentioned earlier the kind of tensions or differences between the eastern european jews the ostjuden and those who lived in the kind of central and western european capitals um vienna for example and considered themselves to be assimilated considered themselves to be kind of full Europeans um, and this was such a, a big issue really for, for Jews of his generation and throughout the 19th century um, this idea that one might be able to kind of scrub off one's Jewishness and become in inverted commas properly European um, a common way of doing that was to convert to Christianity um, 
you know, there were uh, people such as Heine who were kind of role models to emulate in, in that respect, uh, who saw converting to Christianity as at the price of admission to European civilization. And for Roth, it was a very similar thing. I mean, he, when he was serving in the Austro-Hungarian army in the First World War, he became very infatuated with the, the Austrian officer class and the Catholicism of the Austrian upper classes, really. And um, there was so much that he loved about it. Um, it appealed to him in, in, in many ways. Um, but so there began a, a tension between his Jewishness, the Jewishness that was integral to him, the Jewish culture he was born into and steeped in and formed by, um, and the kind of Austrian Catholic culture that he wanted to integrate integrate into and that he admired so much. Um, and the Jewishness on the one hand of Eastern Europe that was seen by by Western Jews and non-Jews as being rather dirty, squalid, backwards for the for the Western Jews, something to leave behind, something rather embarrassing. Um, and Roth was kind of similarly ashamed of his Eastern Jewish origins and yet fundamentally shaped by them. Mm -hmm. um, the Hasidic culture of, of Eastern Europe that he was surrounded by with its belief in, in miracles, miracles being something that actually happened, were kind of, you know, were not just a possibility, but were seen as part of life. Um, he was very shaped by that, and that's something that recurs in his in his novels. Um, and the idea that God might be attainable, um, that God was an interventionist God who could be contacted as well by suitably attuned wonder rabbis. Um, this was something that absolutely haunted or haunted him and fascinated him because he had such an ambivalent relationship with God between feeling that God was there, was with him, um, but also feeling at other times, much of the time, that God was hiding behind the stars, which is something that recurs in his novels again. Um, very often, you find his characters kind of beseeching God to intervene um, and then despairing that God doesn't intervene and God just looks on impassively, distantly from behind the stars. Um, it's this beautiful image that crops up again and again. So his Jewishness, his relationship with his Jewishness is kind of, it's partly bound up in his relationship with God and it's bound up with his relationship with his self as a European of the early 20th century and this fractured self that he had that's torn between his Jewish origins and the place of acceptance that he wanted to work his way towards. And one of the reasons I called the book Endless Flight is that he was in constant in constant flight from his origins and towards the place he wanted to get to, which was a kind of an imagined home, I think, an imagined security, a place of security, which I think really didn't involve being Jewish, it involved being accepted and shaking off his Jewishness. And yet various people said they only ever really saw him happy when he was back among the Eastern Jews that he had grown up amongst. So he was an incredibly conflicted character. He he was at home amongst those people, but there was something about the perceived backwardness of his origins that he was always incredibly uncomfortable with. And and you you mentioned um, why you partly called the book Endless Flight. There is also this rootlessness in him that that he was always on the move. Sometimes forced to be on the move. Yeah. Uh, sometimes because he he wanted to go somewhere. And I, I thought there's a very interesting point um, that he made. You quote him at one point, I'm a stranger in this town. That is why I'm at home here. Yeah. Uh, and um, and it became the basis, obviously, of this rootless as moving around places for a, for a lot of his journalism as well. Yeah. Uh, and also why hotels appear so often in his work as well, I think. it's um, Yes. 
Well, so much of this comes down to his profound need for liberty, which again, I trace to that, largely to that kind of sheltered, constrained upbringing in Brody with his overbearing mother. Um, he, he never wanted to be pinned down again. Um, and the women in his life suffered terribly because of this. I'm not sure we'll go on to talk a bit more about Friedel, his wife, yeah. and the effects that living with him had on her. But um, he never wanted to be committed to anywhere or anyone to the degree that he couldn't just, you know, drop everything and move whenever he wanted to. So living in hotels was fundamental to that, really. Hotel living was the kind of home that he could that he could cope with I mean he had a flat briefly I think in Berlin in 1922 and he basically thought never again he said a flat is something final a crypt he felt you know completely constrained by owning or at least renting a home and having some kind of commitment there uh, hotel living was you know you, you could leave at the drop of a hat and it connects as well with his attitude towards money, which was that money, I think it was integral to buying him freedom. Um, and part of that freedom was the freedom not really to have a family in the conventional sense, but the freedom to have a hotel family, which he often speaks of the hotel staff in terms of family members. He talks about the porter who was a father to me, mm. that kind of thing. And the people who wait upon you in a hotel were kind of like a family whose attentions and um, services could be bought for money. And, um, you know, that was the kind of, in return for money, they were duty bound to, to look after you, kind of care for you, take an interest in you. Um, and there was no obligation on Roth's part to reciprocate in terms of any what i think i'd call in the book a kind of social expenditure mm. you know none of the conventions that w weigh upon those of us who live normal lives if you like and you know taking an interest in the people around you feeling obliged to look after the people around you you know making small talk um expressing interest in you know in, in the and other people's lives he wasn't duty bound to do any of that because um money took care of that yeah. he paid to live in a hotel he paid for people to look after him and if he wanted to just drop everything and go then he could so mm -hmm. that was yeah that was so important to him and he always described didn't he that um he could fit all of his belongings in three suitcases that yep. was um, that was it yes but, yep. let's talk about the first world war uh the the, the war for him was such a pivotal moment in in his work um, it features strongly in many of his books as, as important moments it was also for, for many like him the, the collapse of lots of things that he believed in about civilization but he but he was also a pacifist but he also enlisted didn't he and there, you had to do a lot of work to get through the kind of the the truth of his time during this period yeah so yeah you're right he was a pacifist um for the first two years of the war, he and his friend Josef Wittlin um, were both aspiring writers, both poets, both pacifists, um, and were fairly kind of steadfast in this for the first couple of years. But then bit by bit, they saw friends going off to fight and not return, or friends going off to fight and returning kind of maimed or psychologically maimed at least. Um, and their pacifism came to seem less and less defensible. Uh, that was part of it. Um, they felt kind of morally duty bound to go and, and do their bit. But the other bits, the other element of this was as aspiring writers, they seem to have looked at it rather objectively and coolly as mm. a source of material yeah. and they both felt that um going and serving on the front line would give them an in 
an exposure to an intense life, you know, experiences of life and death that has reasonably sheltered young men to that point they hadn't had before, and they felt this would benefit their writing. They were both kind of fairly physically infirm specimens. Yeah. And it's this rather kind of, you know, darkly comic episode where they absolutely had to persuade the military doctor um, to give them a certificate proving that they were fit to serve because he took one look at them and, you know, said, no, you're, you know, you're not up to scratch, you know, don't worry, you don't have to fight. And they were like, no, we want to, we really want to. So um, they managed to persuade this bemused doctor to um, to allow them to enlist. And then from 1916 onwards, they, they were uh, they were soldiers in the Austrian army. Um, but actually, it's a moot point whether Roth saw any frontline action. There doesn't seem to be any evidence that he, he did. And what he seems to have done is to have worked as a military journalist and censor. Um, so he was writing for one of the soldiers' newspapers um, based in Lemberg, now Lviv. And at one point he was in a military headquarters somewhere in a shtetl. There's a letter that he writes to one of his cousins about saying he's out in some kind of Galician shtetl in the middle of nowhere. But the important thing is, you know, it's very dismal, awful place. But the important thing is, it's several miles behind the front line, so it's reasonably safe. Um, whether in his capacity as a military journalist he went and reported from the front line, we don't know. But certainly he he saw enough uh, that profoundly traumatised him and scarred him in, in ways he would never recover from. And obviously the other huge thing that the First World War did was to obliterate the world that he grew up under yeah. um and one of the key things that i haven't said about his his upbringing in broadly was that he grew up really obsessed by the habsburgs mm. um and i think this is in in lieu of the father that he never had he looks to the emperor franz joseph as um as a kind of paternal protector mm. this benevolent stolid unchanging elderly man who who oversaw Roth's childhood um, and who who finally dies after 68 years in power um, finally dies in 1916 um, you know, a couple of years into the war that he had he had launched um, and um, with the loss of the emperor who he so looked up to, and the empire that he had grown up under, which he rightly saw as a kind of a, a, as a world that, for all its flaws, which he satirised in in his books and kind of gently mocked, most notably in the Radetzky March, but he was still deeply fond of. Um, and with those gone, he could see the writing on the wall really for Europe's Jews, mm. um, and he could see very early on that the ethno nationalism that led to the collapse of Austria Hungary with all these kind of rival ethnic groups kind of jostling for position and and wanting their own states. Um, once you got into the 1920s and you had the nationalism that so defined that, that period, Roth could see very early on where this was going. Mm -hmm. So the collapse of Austria Hungary and the traumas inflicted on on him and so many men of his generation by the war put together it, it was a cataclysm really that um, that he never recovered from he, he has a remarkable eye for detail and an imaginative way of looking at things you you quote an early article from 1919 sorry an early post-war article mm. where he talks about the man dogs who help guide war veterans with disabilities much as a sheep got dog guide sheep and, and i thought that was a remarkable way of talking about it. and, and in, in his writing he, german veterans people who are disabled served in the war veterans throughout um feature in his novels and and i, I even um in your book read that there's a german word for this isn't there yeah heimkehrer romana 
homecomer novels, basically. Um, and this is what his his 1920s novels were almost exclusively. They, they were about men who had gone off to war and been traumatized by it to varying degrees and then come back home, home being in inverted commas, because it turned out not to be much of a home anymore because the place, typically Vienna or Berlin, although they're not always identified as such, um, but the place and the man coming home have both changed irreversibly. And it's about these traumatized men coming back and trying to come home, trying to rediscover home and finding that they don't quite fit really. And that the new post-war society doesn't really have a place for them. These men who gave so much in service of, of their country. So he, he does this again and again throughout the 1920s um, from his first novel, The Spider's Web, which he would later kind of disown and airbrush from his bibli bibliography. Um, and then with Hotel Savoy and Rebellion and onwards from there through the 1920s, he's writing these books about, about these homecoming men. And I, I think Rebellion was one of the ones I reread recently. I do think that's mm -hmm. quite an important book, actually, um, in terms of this post-war literature, in terms of war literature generally, but also in terms of his work. Yeah, it is. I think it's his first really strong novel. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's his, I would say it's his best of his 1920s novels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 1924 it's published. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's the story of Andreas Pum, who in Roth's very succinct phrase, um, where he went to war and lost a leg and gained a medal. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was the kind of trade off. And it seems the world at that point to him seems reasonably just, you know, um he he believes in the order of society that he, of the society that he fought for he he feels that it's fundamentally a, a fair just world and then a succession of traumas and appalling blows um are visited upon him um in a story very much like job in in the bible it's uh, that was clearly a Bible story that mm -hmm. um, that sank in very deep into Roth in in childhood or in adolescence, um, and it was it was a story that haunted him and that he first employs in fiction in in Rebellion, and would later come come back to in his novel Job, which is his first I think his first truly great book, mm -hmm. but. Um, but Rebellion is is a really strong book. It's uh, and it's one in which he's really how can I put it? He, he's tracing. Sorry, I'm just trying to think. How, I'm trying to how I should put this. Um, it's the first full realization of um, him looking at the fate of someone who gives so much in service of his country and in the end receives nothing in, in return and is is broken by society um, which will be a theme of his his novels people typically men almost always men being broken by the society that they have tried mm. to serve um, he does this to some extent in in the spider's web and Hotel Savoy, but it really comes together mm. in, in Rebellion. I, I did spend a lot of time looking into the cinema of the First World War, and particularly the anti-war cinema of the, of the First World War, and one of the themes that came through in Hollywood much later than this was the, the idea of the forgotten man, um, um, and, you know, it featured in gangster films, it featured in crime dramas, it featured indeed in musicals, um, with a very famous song called My Forgotten Man in, uh, of all things, Gold Diggers of 1933. Um, but here it's much earlier, I find. And um, and this is certainly a period we're going to look at in, in our work in the future. Um, just, just a quick question on Spider's Web. Um, yep. this, this really was about also some of the things you talked about before, about the growth of nationalism. And, yes. and was this the one where 
Hitler was first mentioned in, in a yeah. novel. It's yeah. said that this is the first novel that mentions Hitler. Um, it seems to be the first, you know, 1923, it certainly seems to be the, the first novel in which Hitler is mentioned. Um, it's a novel that's it's very flawed in, in many ways. It seems either to be unfinished or it's not quite clear. I mean, it was it appeared in newspaper serialization first of all, mm. and it's possible that the serialization was just abandoned by the newspaper because <clears throat> it started the it started to mirror reality and the rise of Hitler and Hitler's trial um, so so closely that quite possibly it was it wasn't politic for the newspapers to continue mm. running the serialization. It doesn't work all that well in structural terms as a novel but it, where it does work very well is as an insight into the psychology of of a nationalist mm. um and roth was obviously fascinated in a very troubled way by these very damaged angry young men who had emerged from the war um and come back home and found that they weren't they didn't feel truly appreciated they were obviously very angered that um Germany and Austria had had lost the war and were looking for someone to blame and you know the stab in the back myth yeah. kind of developed from there um and so the spider's web is kind of looking at the mindset of a nationalist which was obviously something that was preoccupying Roth by the early 1920s and he was very troubled by this and pretty early on he could see where it could be going um and so the spider's web for all its flaws is it's still remarkable and interesting for its prescience. It shows that he was attuned to where Europe was heading yeah. before a lot of people were. Yeah. So. I mean, I think we'll we'll come back at the end about the kind of warnings that someone like Roth could could write about and and to the dead today really. But we'll, we'll come back to the end. I, I want yeah. to talk about the Wandering Jews book. This is a significant nonfiction work, um, and it showed. You know, particularly these Jewish people in exile, wandering around, being found, um, the places they tried to settle in unwelcome, cities and towns. Uh, and it also included a section on Jewish people in Soviet in, in Soviet Russia, didn't it? Where he spent yes. a, he spent time um, yep. in Moscow and other places. It did. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating book. It's a, a survey of Europe's Jews in, in the mid 1920s, um, kind of city by city, um, and then looking at the, the shtetl of Galicia, the shtetls of Galicia, and um, and yes, um, looking at the Soviet Jews situation as well. Um, that section being based on his impressions during a trip in 1926, um, he was already ambivalent about communism. He, as a student and kind of in the early 1920s, he was kind of socialist communist. He was, um, in his early newspaper bylines, he was known as Red Joseph, Walter Joseph. Um, uh, because he was known as a kind of fiery left-wing political commentator. Um, um, but then he was, before many other people, he, he began to grow concerned, ambivalence about where things, the direction things were heading in Russia, in, in the Soviet Union. And it came about that um, he had the opportunity to, to travel there, uh, make a long trip, about six months, um, this came out of a situation which again caused him immense pain, immense trauma, which was that in 1925 he had got to he managed to get out of Germany, which was, you know, Berlin, Germany were troubling him profoundly. The rise of nationalism, he was deeply disturbed by he he hated it. It was making him extremely depressed. Um, he managed to get out and get a transfer to uh, Paris, still writing for the Frankfurt and Zeitung newspaper, which is who he was working for by that time. And he comes to Paris in 1925 and is absolutely ecstatic, euphoric. I mean, you know, the letters he writes from that from that time 
are like nothing else. It's the absolute apex of his happiness. And it's sadly a very brief apex. Mm. It's 1925, the kind of the summer of 1925, really. Um, he's raving to his friend and editor at the newspaper, Benno Reifenberg, about you must come to Paris. You know, it's the capital of it's the capital of the world. It's the most extraordinary, beautiful place. At last, I you know I've come home, and this theme of home that I keep coming to in the book. Um, yeah, you know, um, and so he really found he felt that he'd found himself in Paris, and just when he's finding a perch for himself, um, then it's snatched away again. He felt that he had been promised this um uh, this role as the kind of the paris correspondent for the frankfurt Zeitung, um but then it's snatched away again it's given to one of his rivals on the newspaper a, another writer um and roth feels absolutely betrayed feels that his his promise his chance of happiness has been snatched away from him he gets very angry and starts burning his bridges with the newspaper writing very angry awful letters to his colleagues he was a very difficult colleague, you know, um, liable to absolutely you know, just fire these streams of invective as uh, people who he was working with. Um, and it all goes horribly pear-shaped for him at, at the Frankfurt Society. And then, but it, out of trying to patch things up, out of, you know, um, with with the newspaper, they say to him, well, you know, what, what, can, what can we do that would be would satisfy you um and he ends up saying well only a trip to to moscow and around the soviet union that that's the only thing that can re repair my journalistic reputation after this profound embarrassment um so he ends up going on this long trip around the soviet union um and it's it was fascinating for him it's disabused him of his lingering of any lingering illusions about the Soviet Union. They were they were fading already when he got there. They were completely gone by the time he left. Um, he met Walter Benjamin while he was there, um, who writes about it in his in his diary, was not enamored of Roth at all. Um, wrote about him very unflatteringly and says something about Roth being one of these kind of pinkish journalists who um who came here and um, was kind of wined and dined and then just you know left uh, to write very unflatteringly about about the Soviet experiments. Um, so to get around to what you're asking me about, one of the things that came out of this experience was that he had the material he needed to finish The Wandering Jews, which is a, a wonderful little book. Um, it's really um there's a lot that you can tell about his own jewishness in there as well um reading between the lines you pick up a certain ambivalence and one of the one of the main ways that you can see this is when he is writing about the shtetl that he describes nowhere does he describe nowhere does he mention that it is again to use that word a homecoming mm -hmm. of sorts he describes it as if he were an intrepid adventurer from afar, from the sophisticated cosmopolitan Central European capitals, kind of venturing on behalf of his readers out into the, the backward eastern kind of shtetl. And um, you would never know that actually he was going back to somewhere that was, if not Brody, the town where he grew up, and somewhere very similar. He never names the shtetl in the book, but um, it's fascinating that he can never say that this is actually basically where he grew up. Mm. So once you know that, then reading The Wandering Jews mm. tells you something really interesting about his attitude to mm. his own Jewishness. There's also something in there about um, the clean shaven Jew, he says, is something like a, a mockery of himself, you know, as someone who is compared or opposed to the, the Eastern Jews who were typically kind of fully bearded. The clean shaven Western Jew is kind of shaving, you know, is kind of dressing himself up in a way that's aping Christians. Um, mm. 
and he's making clear this is absolutely tragic. Well, Roth himself was a clean-shaven Jew by the time of writing this, you know. So there's quite a lot in that book that tells you about his feelings towards himself and the kind of the self-contempt that was wrapped up in the in his own reinvention as a kind of almost non-Jewish Jew. And and just rounding off talking about some of his books, of course, the great book is the Rudetsky March, yeah. which has become a 20th century classic. What what makes that a, a great book for you? Oh well, um it's it's a it's a novel that's an entire world in itself. I mean it's much longer than any of his other books, which are typically really quite short. Um, you know, it's kind of 360 odd pages in English translation. And he really stretches out and creates this beautiful, sad, haunting, haunted world, which is the world of the Austria-Hungary that he grew up in, um, which he so mourned after its collapse. Um, and the novel is told over three generations of the Trotter family. So, um, so his grandfather, um, who became known as the hero of the Battle of Solferino, um, who literally took a bullet for the emperor, Franz Joseph, um, and by kind of pulling the emperor down on the battlefield and standing in his way and being hit by bullets and saving the emperor's life um and in return for this he is ennobled um and becomes baron von trotter um which seems like a favor but actually is something that kind of pulls him out of his natural position in society um and reroutes the course of his his family's direction and history um and spells trouble really for the subsequent generations. So his his son, who becomes a kind of upper middle class uh, functionary, a bu bureaucrat, really um, a kind of hollow man who is so hollowed out by the constraints of this hidebound Austrian military bureaucratic culture. Um, that he knows the conventions for everything, but he doesn't have any emotions. He doesn't know how to relate to anyone. And so he raises his son, Carl Joseph von Trotter, um, and the son, Carl, goes into the army, um, but is a completely kind of empty, sad, directionless, one character. Um, he just has he doesn't really have any direction in his life um, other than after a time that he develops a drinking habit while he's mm. he's serving in the army. And as I think I say in the book, um, if there's a direction to to the novel, ultimately it's, um, it's the character's pursuit of the next drink. Mm. It's a kind of a meandering novel in many ways. It's <clears throat> big and baggy and sometimes you think it's going one way and it veers another way the pleasure is not in the kind of in the tautness of the plot it's in the depth and re realism of the world that he creates mm. and the deep sadness of its characters the emotional depth of its characters and the tragedy of the Trotter family um, and it's also a novel that is a deeply alcoholic novel um and it's one that could only be written by a man who knew the tragedy of alcoholism intimately mm -hmm. as Roth did by the early 30s when when he wrote this book the Rudetsky march is very different to his other books i find yeah. um, historically where it's situated but also actually as you've said in length and certainly the alcoholism element does come through and as you said this is something that he suffered from as well. And also very different, I find, is, is a lot of his journalism. I mean, I, th I do think it's remarkable that at the same time he was writing these sometimes incredible novels, he was also writing enormous amounts of journalism um, yeah. for, obviously, to earn money, 
uh, but also to reflect the places that he lived in. And I'd like to talk about some of those places now and some of that writing. You you, you talked to her about Paris and about how he 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 loved that that city uh, for the time he was there. I mean, Berlin is where I guess he was most associated. But before that, he came to he came to Vienna, and um, and there I think he he did have some part of a good time before the war because he could be with other writers be in those cafes where he could discuss these things and begin to to serve his um his early years i think as in the development of his writing is that right yeah i mean vienna was um it, it was the making of him in in many ways you know he he emerged emerged as a writer as a journalist there in the years immediately following the first world war the first newspapers that he was published by were in Vienna, um, and um, it was somewhere that was, as the the seat of Habsburg power, it was somewhere that had always meant a huge amount to him. Um, so he he first made a name for himself as a journalist in Vienna. Then he wanted to. Um, to develop his career. And at that point, by the early 1920s, about 1922, um, it seemed that the, the thing to do, the place to be um, was was to go to Berlin. Um, so Berlin kind of attracted him a bit like a as a flame attracts a moth. You know, it was it was that's the effect it had on people then. It wasn't somewhere people hugely liked, but it was somewhere that one needed to go. Um, you know, and it was it was somewhere that really Berlin then kind of really de developed him further as a writer. Then he goes back to Vienna. Um, so he's kind of going back between Vienna mm. and Berlin, but in the process, establishing himself as one of the preeminent German language journalists of, of the early to mid 1920s. Um, and as you say, at the same time, he's starting to write novels as well. He had ambitions beyond the half page form, the feuilleton form that was his, his mainstay as a journalist, as much as he was extremely adept at, at doing that, um, writing these poetic, impressionistic little sketches. Um, he knew that he wanted to write something that really intellectually satisfied him, where he could really stretch out over, you know, over the, something that had the scope of a novel. So he starts trying to write these novels, but he's also got to to pay the bills. And so he keeps writing journalism at an incredibly prolific rate yeah. as well. His work rate in the 1920s was just extraordinary. I mean, it's a man, a man with a point to prove, a man living entirely by his wits, you know, no money behind him. He'd, he had had his education underwritten by his uncle, but really from from adult life, early adult life onwards, he was having to, to pay his way. And his work rate was just phenomenal. The, the newspaper articles he was churning out, again and again, an extraordinary high level of consistency in terms of quality. Um, but then he starts writing these novels as well. Um, he was a, just, a, a fin his output was absolutely phenomenal. Um, it wasn't sustainable, of course. I mean, you know, he, he did begin to burn himself out. And that's kind of the point where the drinking kicks in as well mm -hmm. from the late 1920s. Um, but, yeah, it, it was an incredible output. I mean, the, the, the feuilleton were particularly suitable for urban life, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And about because his the the ability to observe people on the streets, he, yeah. he wouldn't do interviews or felt that they were not necessary for good good writing and um yeah. and um and you know there's a wonderful collection in fact we're fortunate we have two wonderful collections actually one is the white cities mm -hmm. about the fracturing of europe and, and especially i think what i saw reports from berlin where where you say in writing what he saw he provided a mirror in which berlin could scrutinize itself and presented the readers with an indictment of weimar life and that really comes through that collection very strongly, I find. But of course, Berlin was where he could make his name and, and a living, and there were plenty of opportunities to do that. He became the star journalist uh, on the newspaper, as you say. But it was also Berlin where he was eventually had to leave on, you know, as when Hitler came to power 
and his were one of the first books that were thrown into the the book burnings of 1933. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he went into exile 1933 as soon as Hitler took power. Um, Roth was on the next train yeah. out of Berlin. Um, it wasn't he didn't know that he would never go back, but um, but he wouldn't. And so uh, he, he lived the rest of his life in exile. Um, and um, yeah, for someone who was always kind of looking for a home, looking for somewhere where he felt at home earlier in his life, from that point onwards, um, German speaking, the German speaking world really felt like somewhere that he couldn't countenance being, it being a home of any sort. Um, and so, and the tragedy is, of course, he was he was a master of the German language. Mm. And yet by that point, he despised the language of these people who were persecuting him and and his fellow Jews. And, and yet he's compelled to write in the language that he hates so much. So mm. I say something in the book about, he, you know, he even hated he, he hated the language in which his thoughts were formed. Yeah. There's a profound self-loathing at work there. You know, he felt so discomforted by being a German language writer who was then completely rejected by German culture and had to exile himself from it. Um, so from 1933 onwards, he's he's living in exile um, in a variety of places, largely in Paris. Um, the publishing houses that published him once he was an exiled writer um, and couldn't be published in Germany um, were based in Amsterdam and Brussels. So increasingly he spends his time kind of around there as well. Um, Amsterdam, Amsterdam becomes a key location for him. Um, so I ended up spending some time in Amsterdam and writing a bit about his time there. Um, but yeah, it's fundamentally Paris is, is his, his key location from 1933 onwards. Mm. Um, and it's somewhere that felt like home if anywhere did, but he was a deeply unhappy man by that point anyway. And anyway, mm. and nowhere felt very much like home. I mean, the whole period in the third, I mean, the many tragedies in, in the book about this period. And one of them is, of course, his wife, who um, becomes mentally ill, is, is incarcerated in a hospital and is eventually murdered by the Nazis. Yeah, Friedel, um, Friederike Reichler, or Friedel, as she was known, um, they met when she was... 19 he was about 25 um and he was infatuated with her she was very beautiful mm. charming sweet funny not very worldly at all not very educated had a kind of uneducated intelligence um they married a couple of years later married in 1922 only a few days after Roth's mother had died. Um, and it was probably the, the pivotal bad decision of his life um, that he married this, this very sweet, charming, but deeply troubled young woman um, who perhaps would have been okay if she had been able to live you know, a kind of reasonably quiet, steady, life somewhere where her innately nervous dis disposition wasn't overly exacerbated by external factors. Instead, she attached herself to, to Joseph Roth and lived a life of constant transit, mm. constant insecurity, living by his wits, living from one pay packet to the next, constantly zigzagging back and forth across Europe, living in hotels, separated pretty much from her parents and and sisters who she'd grown up with and um you know having very little stability in her life and she was clearly someone who needed stability needed reassurance instead she got the complete opposite and she lived with this man who was just in constant motion um 
and increasingly drinking. And his drinking is becoming a problem by the mid 1920s. And her psychiatric difficulties are becoming a problem by then too. The long trip to Russia that I mentioned earlier, that's the big trigger moment really. Um, he leaves her on her own for six months, leaves her in Berlin, which she would describe with a shudder later, mm. talking to his friend Soma Morgenstern, um, who was a, a novelist and friend of some years standing. In his memoir of, of his friendship with Roth, he describes spending time with Friedel and her saying, he left me alone in Berlin. And Morgenstern says she described it uh, as if he had left her alone in a forest surrounded by wolves. Um, and so this experience of him abandoning her, clearing off to the Soviet Union for six months, wandering around on his own and kind of finding himself um, was absolutely disastrous for his marriage and for her mental health. Um, and it's the beginning of the end, really, in terms of her mental health, their marriage, and his mental health as well, because from that point onwards, the drinking just accelerates. Mm -hmm. 1928, Friedel, what was almost certainly schizophrenia, becomes kind of full blown, fully manifests. Um, and she, from that point, is in and out of psychiatric care. That's the moment where his drinking goes from being a bit of a problem to something absolutely systematic in, yeah. in 1928. 1930, she's institutionalized once and for all um, and is never released from psychiatric care again. And yeah, it's just a deeply haunting, tragic, awful story um, of a very vulnerable young woman who, whose life was ruined really by her association with this very volatile, unsteady man. And he felt, for all that he felt very ang angry at times um, with the way that he felt duty bound to support her, um, you know, he had to work constantly to, to pay her psychiatric fees, uh, psychiatric care fees. Um, he always, he always did look after her, you know, he mm. always, he fulfilled those duties. Um, but it was just a, uh, a deeply troubling relationship, really. Um, yeah. And it was the ruin of both of them. The second tragedy I wanted to talk about in the book, and it was also a story of friendship, is is his relationship with with the writer Stefan Zweig. Just, just tell us a little bit about that. Okay, yeah. So Stefan Zweig was a, a very well known writer. Well, he's still very well known, but um, he'd really become quite prominent by by the nineteen twenties um, as a biographer and writer of short stories. Um, he was someone who Roth was of, evidently aware of by the time of his student days. There's this story that um, while living in Vienna, where, where Zweig was living at that time, uh, Roth went and knocked on his door, just hoping to meet this kind of well-known author who might possibly be able to help with his own literary ambitions. Um, Zweig didn't answer the door and in the end Roth walks away again um, but they do they did come to know each other from the late 1920s onwards um, it's when The Wandering Jews was published um, and Zweig wrote something praising that book and Roth then wrote him a letter thanking him and they corresponded from there um, and it was a really interesting friendship because they pretty much embody that divide between European Jews that, that I mentioned earlier. So you have Roth, who's from Eastern Europe, um, impoverished background, and you have Zweig, who 
kind of grown up with some family money, kind of middle class Jewish family in Vienna, um, and kind of thought of himself as assimilated, thought, you know. Um, and so people of, of his ilk, then Brody was not really somewhere you, one really wanted to think about. You know, it was, uh, you know, that was where the grandparents had kind of labored to leave behind. Um, so there was a certain amount of awkwardness on Roth's part when talking with Swag about the world that he'd come from. He felt rather embarrassed. Um, but the other really important element of the kind of, the sort of imbalance between them is a financial issue. Yeah. Roth had no money and Swag had money. Um, and the one other key point is talent. There's also an, an imbalance of talent. They would both readily have admitted that Roth was the greater writer. Um, Zweig made no bones about that at all. Um, so Zweig had money, Roth didn't. Zweig had some talent, but he wasn't a great writer. Roth did have substantial talent. And so Zweig, being a very generous and I think rather guilty kind of a character who had a certain amount of guilt about the amount of money he had, um, you know, was perfectly happy to spend some, some of that money on supporting Joseph Roth, keeping him writing, keeping him in hotels, keep basically sort of keeping him alive, keeping him <laughs> above the poverty line. Um, but it becomes a really tempestuous, toxic relationship where because Roth felt very strongly that he had to be seen as incorruptible. Uh, uh, he had a very strong conscience in many important ways for all, for all that he could behave appallingly at times as well. He had to be seen as incorruptible. So one of the ways that he handled that was, although he took money repeatedly from Zweig, he didn't want anyone to think that Zweig had bought his friendship. So... <laughs> He demonstrated this by behaving incredibly obnoxiously mm. towards Zweig. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, abusive letters, ridiculing him in public, you name it, horrible behavior, but which to Roth was a way of demonstrating his integrity and his incorruptibility. No one could ever claim that Zweig had bought Roth's friendship. So um, it mm. was a very, a very strange relationship. And as you say, a tragic one. Um, and there's a wonderful series of letters between the two men over the course of the 1930s, um, which just details the, this collapse in, in this friendship. Um, and Zweig, in very well-meaning, but sometimes rather crass terms, urging Roth to get help. When I say crass, I mean kind of patronising. He wasn't rude, but you know, he was clearly speaking in a rather condescending manner telling him it's time to get his affairs in order, offering to look at Roth's papers and kind of financial dealings and contractual obligations to publishers and kind of saying this in a rather condescending paternal tone. You know, Swag was a, a little older, um, but not that much older. Um, so Roth would quite often feel belittled, um, Zweig clearly felt very insulted and uh, at times just completely frozen out. And you can see how hurt he is in the letters. It's really touching. It's, you know, it's a great vulnerability there. Zweig evidently revered Roth. You know, it's, it seemed like no insult was quite enough to entirely put him off. Yeah. However rude Roth was towards him, Zweig would keep coming back because there was something clearly that he'd really liked about him mm -hmm. um and he hugely admired his talent as a writer um but it's a relationship a friendship that just you know it kind of burns out and the letters become sadder and sadder and more infrequent and in the end there's a very poignant one from Zweig writing to Roth saying it's been some time since I heard from you I hear from other people of what you're up to it really saddens me that I never hear anything from you directly anymore and there's mm -hmm. no record of a reply to that. 
it's, it's one incredibly of, poignant. Yeah, it's one of the saddest books I've read, but also one of the saddest end to a book with that letter. I, I've remembered that long since I finished reading the book. I mean, when Roth died, it, 1939, just before the war, the Second World War broke out, mm. he looked a totally broken man. I mean, you you track this through some of the pictures and actually line drawings that you include in the book. Yeah. He looked so much older than 44, didn't he? He did, yeah. I mean, I, I'm 44 and... I don't always feel that I look hugely good for my age, but my God, if, if I need any reassurance, I can look at some late pictures of Joseph Roth because yeah. he aged about 20 years in five years, mm. really, yeah. um, in the yeah, sort of early early 1930s. Um, an extraordinary transformation, just, you know, intensive drinking. Um, he loses his hair. He puts on a great deal of weight. Um his liver becomes distended. Um, he grows this moustache, which was kind of intended to obscure the fact that his teeth and his kind of gums were loosening. His teeth were starting to fall out. I, I describe it in the book as looking rather like a kind of raggedy moth resting on his upper lip. Um, poor man looked absolutely, he looked a wreck by the end. Um, mm. And he was in those final photos, he looks so deeply sad as well. Yeah. And he looks like someone who's just seen something. It looks like the photo's just been taken after he's just seen a train wreck or something. I mean, he looks shocked and kind of blank and deeply sad. Um, so, yeah, he was um, just, yeah, it's a, a terrible physical decline. Shuffling around, you know, he had, he had a heart attack in 1938 which obviously weakened him still further. There's these very poignant descriptions of him, again, from Soma Morgenstern's book of you know, spending time with him in Paris towards the end and walking around the Jardin du Luxembourg and Roth having to stop every few paces to kind of loosen his shoelaces because his feet were so swollen from the water retention, from, uh, from the alcoholism. Um, and one of the things that I was most pleased about in my research was um, was to find someone who remembered him. I was really delighted by this because I was told at the outset, um, of course, there's no one left who remembers him. You know, he died in 1939. Uh, all his contemporaries are very long gone. Um, but I did find someone. I, I was um, I was recommended to get in touch with this guy. Dan Morgenstern, who is the son of Soma Morgenstern. Dan is now, I think, 93 years old. Yeah, I think so. Um, but he remembers Roth from being nine years old in Paris in um, October 1938. And it's wonderful, you know, to talk to this man who has this brief but intense recollection of meeting one of his father, father's friends in Paris in what turned out to be, you know, the final months of Roth's life, early on in Dan Morgenstern's life, this little overlap. Um, and it made for a little kind of vignette that I put at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. this memory of seeing Roth at the very end. And one of the things that came across very clearly was that even though Roth was only kind of 44 years old um he was very infirm you know a, a very diminished figure by then and dan recalls him walking everywhere with a cane kind of propping himself up levering himself up um from his chair using his cane and shuffling around in a you know, very frail kind of manner really um although dan was only young himself he, he said it was pretty clear to him that Roth didn't have very long to go, um, which is an indication of just what a state Roth was in really towards the end of his life. It's 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 remarkable though that we still have that recollection, and you were able to to find that. I think it it does round the life off uh, in, in in a way. I think just one final question, which is we mm. talked earlier about the warnings that a writer like Roth can can to, can teach us today, really. I mean, during the time, as we discussed, his early novel, The, the Spider's Web, 
you know, was a warning about nationalism. Uh, and these are similar warnings we've had today. I think there's also other issues like the life of the exile, you know, refugees and how they're treated. And indeed, the war in Ukraine. Do you think it's reading too much into the work to, to consider the lessons for today? Or do you think there are lessons for today in, in, in what Roth wrote about? I think there are, yes. I think um, the, oh, how can I put it, the issues about nationalism, about identities that are based on exclusion of others, which seem to me as true today as they were in his time. And Roth was someone who was so concerned with an international spirit. He hated borders. He hated nation states. He hated tribalism. This is one of the reasons he was ambivalent about his Jewishness. He felt that he didn't want to be identified as being part of any kind of specific people. Um, he was incredibly brave writing during the Nazi era about, um, as he puts it, that, like the, the benefits of race mixing, as he puts it, to use the kind of terminology they were using when they were talking about racial purity. He was saying, no, the more ingredients into the recipe, the better. Um, so he was someone who was all about building bridges and about creating international connections. That's one of the reasons that Catholicism appealed to him as well. He saw it as supranational in spirit, um, something that could kind of tether together Europe in the way that the Austro-Hungarian Empire did. Um, so there are things that we can take, I think, about looking for looking for the ways in which people are connected rather than focusing on the ways in which we are different um, and understanding where nationalism can lead, understanding where identities can lead that are based on excluding other people and mm, ideas about oneself and one's nation that are based on myth. Those are things that were really prevalent then and we are seeing again now, absolutely. So I do see, I do see genuine connections between then and now in that respect. Well, thank you very much, Kieran. Endless Flight, The Life of Joseph Roth is published by Granter. And as I mentioned earlier, Granter also published many of the books written by Roth. Kieran's book is highly recommended. Thank you for Endless Flight and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.